Frank Jerome, the priest in charge of St. Thomas Parish, dedicated himself to leading his flock and ensuring everything was done in the right way, however, a series of challenges emerged when the church's offerings began to mysteriously disappear. Faced with this dilemma, Frank took it upon himself to investigate and uncover the culprit, leading to a shocking revelation from the outset. Frank Jerome was not the favored priest among the parishioners, since his transfer to St. Thomas Parish. He seldom received invitations to visit parishioners, and the number of times he had been welcomed into someone's home could be counted on one hand, despite the respect due to a priest, people maintained a certain distance from him. Frank was not the type of priest whom people loved to gather around, and children didn't run to him for a comforting prayer. Nevertheless, he effectively ran the parish, demonstrating frugality in church expenses and keeping everything in top shape though not a people person. Frank ensured that masses were concise, a quality appreciated by the parishioners, unlike the previous priest, who tended to prolong mass, Frank's sermons rarely exceeded two hours, the church operated smoothly, with a balanced coexistence between the people and the priest, however, the harmony was disrupted when the church's offerings began to go missing, Frank, determined to resolve the issue, initiated an investigation to identify the culprit, unbeknownst to him, what he would discover would be truly shocking despite the challenges, Frank Jerome successfully managed to run the parish efficiently, he maintained frugality in the church's expenses, ensuring everything was in top shape, parishioners appreciated his approach, especially during mass, where he kept the proceedings concise, unlike the previous priest, Frank's mass rarely exceeded two hours, earning him favor among the congregation, the church thrived as people and priests found a way to coexist harmoniously, However, a crisis emerged when One morning, Frank Jerome discovered a disturbing situation while checking the donations, the offering basket was empty, and all the money donated on Sunday had vanished, distraught, Frank recognized the importance of the money for running the affairs of the parish, and its sudden disappearance would impact the finances significantly, stealing from the church was deemed akin to stealing from God. Raising questions about who would dare commit such an act despite the gravity of the situation. Frank chose to keep quiet, he refrained from informing the elders to avoid causing alarm, and he didn't involve the police to prevent the matter from escalating or tarnishing the church's reputation. In the interim, he personally compensated for the stolen funds using his own resources. However, as the week progressed, Frank decided to launch his investigation to identify the thief, during morning masses on weekdays, Frank centered his sermons on the theme of stealing and taking things from the house of God. While preaching, he keenly observed the reactions of the parishioners, hoping to identify any clues that might lead him to the thief, the countenances of the congregation became a focus as Frank sought subtle hints that could unveil the culprit behind the disappearance of the church's offerings. Unfortunately, this approach proved unsuccessful, another Sunday passed, and by Monday morning, the offering had disappeared once again, Frank Jerome, facing the recurrence of the issue, found himself at his wit's end, with still no clue about the identity of the thief, he remained hesitant to inform the church elders, instead, he decided to implement strict measures for the parishioners, henceforth, the offering would be kept in a safe, accessible only to a select few, this way, if the money went missing again, he would be able to identify those responsible, however. That week brought not only the challenge of the missing offering but also a series of unexplainable events. Frank Jerome found himself dealing with unexpected occurrences. On Wednesday, he woke up with an injury on his big toe, appearing as though he had hit it against something, perplexed, as the night before, his toe had been perfectly fine, undeterred by the injury. He proceeded with his daily activities, including preparing for the morning mass, unable to wear shoes or sandals due to the toe injury, he opted for palm slippers. The parishioners were taken aback to see their parish priest in such attire, looking haggard and unkempt, despite the unusual appearance, they said nothing about it. Over the next few days, the number of parishioners attending morning mass drastically dropped. The following Sunday, Frank Jerome woke up with a severe headache, blurry vision, and an overwhelming sense of fatigue, despite these challenges, he persevered and, as always, pushed through to prepare for Mass, the mysterious events continued to unfold, leaving Frank Jerome with no explanations, during the Mass, a sudden strong urge to sleep overwhelmed Frank, Jerome, the situation escalated to the point that, 
while giving communion, he dozed off for a few seconds, causing the host to slip from his hands, fortunately, the quick action of the altar boy beside him saved the situation as he caught the host in the communion plate, this peculiar incident didn't occur just once but three times, drawing the attention of the parishioners to the priest's strange behaviors. Concerns began to spread among the parishioners, but none felt comfortable confronting. Frank Jerome directly, instead, they decided to inform the elders, who, in turn, planned to talk to him after Mass. The elders were keen on preventing a loss of faith in their priest, however, just as Frank Jerome was about to conclude the Mass, a terrifying event unfolded, the door suddenly flew open, and a disheveled-looking man rushed in, with unkempt hair and dirty clothes. The church wardens attempted to escort him out, but he started screaming about impending doom, proclaiming that they were stealing from God and that they would all die. His fear-inducing outburst left the parishioners frightened, and whispers of potential theft circulated among them as chaos ensued, with suspicion growing among the congregation, Frank Jerome decided to reveal the truth about the stolen offerings, he apologized for not disclosing it earlier and assured them that he was actively working to resolve the matter, however, he noticed that the church members were not focused on him, instead, their suspicious gazes were directed toward a man sitting in the far corner of the church, this man happened to be an ex-convict, previously arrested for armed robbery, recently released from prison, Frank Jerome urged them not to judge or suspect anyone prematurely, promising to investigate thoroughly. After the Mass, the priest convened with the elders, and they suggested the installation of cameras in the room where the offering was kept and in the parish shops. That evening, they acquired the cameras and proceeded to install them as a precautionary measure. Come Monday morning, the offering was once again missing, but this time Frank Jerome wasn't worried, he was confident that the installed camera would finally reveal the identity of the thief. That night, he connected the camera to his computer and eagerly clicked on the video from the previous night. Anticipation filled him as he prepared to catch the culprit red-handed, however. What unfolded on the video left Frank Jerome in utter shock. As the footage played, he witnessed himself. Unlocking the safe room, entering, and taking the offering, he then walked out, locking the room behind him, bewildered and in disbelief. He fell back in shock, the realization hit him like a tidal wave, he was the thief, placing his hands over his mouth, he struggled to suppress a scream, how could he not remember stealing the money, continuing to watch the video, he saw himself take the money to his room, searching his closet and under his bed, there, under the bed, lay every single offering, that had been stolen. Overwhelmed, he gasped, questioning his own actions, despite being hurt by his own deeds, he was surprised because he had no recollection of stealing the church's offerings, in that moment, he cried out to God for rescue and forgiveness, suddenly, a memory from his past resurfaced, Frank Jerome was a sleepwalker in his youth, his parents and siblings used to recount the things he did in his sleep, including one sleeping in the front yard after stepping out of the house, by the time he turned 16. The sleepwalking had seemingly ceased, and he never thought about it again, now, he realized that it had returned, and each time he had gotten up to steal the offerings, he had been sleepwalking, this revelation explained his lack of memory and shed light on how he must have injured his toe the other day, seeking medical help, Frank Jerome visited a doctor who prescribed medications to aid his sleep, the next day, he wrote a letter to his bishop, requesting leave to focus on his well-being, the following Sunday, he gathered the parishioners and truthfully shared the story of the missing money, expressing remorse for his mistake, he promised to seek treatment, and his honesty touched the hearts of the congregation, they bid him farewell, urging him to return as soon as his leave was over, this poignant story prompted reflection, if you were in Frank Jerome's shoes, what would you have done, share your thoughts in the comments below, until the next video, take care, let's continue, in the stillness of the night, Marcus placed the camera within the confines of his late daughter's coffin, as darkness enveloped the surroundings, he played the video recordings, only to be gripped by an overwhelming horror, the weather outside seemed incongruent with Marcus's internal turmoil, though the sun shone brightly around him, he felt entrenched in a profound darkness, a depth from which crawling out seemed impossible, his gaze shifted downward to Alexa's fresh grave, at the tender age of six. She had left behind a future filled with promise. The realization of the years stolen from her brought forth more tears, 
and Marcus, overcome with grief, bored in pain, a momentary relief followed as he let out the pent-up frustration, the mourners had departed long ago, leaving Marcus alone with his sorrow, however, one woman lingered, Dawn, standing a few paces behind Marcus, Dawn observed his grieving heart with empathy, while she couldn't fully comprehend his pain, having been by his side throughout the ordeal, she understood the depths of his emotions, approaching slowly, Dawn positioned herself next to Marcus, speaking in a gentle, somber, and affectionate voice, she vowed never to leave his side, acknowledging the time needed for healing, in her promise, she assured Marcus that they would build a future together, and she would give him another daughter, one who would resemble Alexa, overwhelmed with emotion, Marcus embraced Dawn, his tears soaking her blouse, in that shared moment of solace, the weight of grief found a temporary release, and together, they faced the journey of healing and the prospect of a renewed future, the weight of guilt consumed Marcus as he confessed to Dawn, I feel so guilty, Selene, Selen would never forgive me for not protecting our daughter, I failed my late wife, I failed Selene, I couldn't save her daughter's life, Dawn, standing beside him, wrapped her hands around his waist, pulling him closer, she gently patted his back, urging him to calm down, and reassured him that Selene, an understanding woman, wouldn't hold a grudge, Dawn was certain that Selene had already forgiven Marcus and harbored no blame for the tragic fate that befell Alexa, attempting to shift Marcus's perspective, Dawn suggested that Alexa had gone to be with her mom, providing her company, despite this consolation, Marcus still grappled with intense guilt, Dawn, determined to break through his sorrow, took hold of his face and compelled him to meet her gaze, in a declaration of fierce love, she affirmed, her unwavering affection for him, Dawn expressed her desire to spend the rest of her life proving that love to him, Marcus, too grief-stricken to respond, stared at her, sensing his inner turmoil, Dawn swallowed her disappointment at his lack of words, instead, she embraced him, holding on tightly, the bond between Dawn and Marcus traced back to their childhood, they were inseparable since middle school, attending the same high school and college, Dawn had harbored feelings for Marcus, but fearing the loss of their friendship, she concealed them, even in college, they started a successful business together, born from Marcus's keen eye for appreciating properties and Dawn's ability to sell high-value real estate, their journey together had flourished, especially as their business took off towards the end of college, after graduation, they registered the business, and it quickly evolved into a thriving real estate company. Dawn held immense significance in Marcus's life, his childhood friend, business partner, biggest supporter, and confidant, unbeknownst to Marcus, Dawn harbored unrequited feelings for him, as the company expanded, they needed additional help, and Dawn, who also worked in HR, conducted interviews to fill various roles during this time, Celine applied for the position of Marcus's secretary, impressed by her intelligence and quick thinking, Dawn hired her, little did she know that Marcus would fall in love with Celine at first sight, when Marcus and Celine started dating, Dawn chose to act as if everything was normal, silently grappling with her own emotions, she initially believed it was a fleeting romance that would soon pass. To Dawn's dismay, Marcus and Celine's relationship escalated rapidly, leading to Marcus's proposal and their impending marriage. Learning of the engagement, Dawn struggled to breathe, tears streaming down her cheeks. Attending the wedding became an agonizing decision, though her heart shattered. Dawn knew avoiding the ceremony would fuel gossip due to her closeness to Marcus. During the wedding, Dawn sat stiff as a stone, feigning happiness for the couple, as they exchanged vows, she imagined interrupting, walking down the aisle, and declaring that Marcus was meant to marry her, however, in reality, she remained silent, when the officiator asked for objections, Dawn envisioned herself stopping the ceremony, but she stayed in her seat, enduring the applause as the couple kissed, the wedding party proved challenging for Dawn, barely speaking to anyone, she forced herself to endure the festivities, toward the end, as Marcus headed to the restroom, he spotted Dawn ahead, clutching her chest and struggling to breathe, worry gripped him, witnessing the toll the unspoken pain had taken on his longtime friend, Marcus, concerned for Dawn, ran after her and found her in the women's restroom, they were alone, and Dawn was in tears, her shoulders shaking uncontrollably, and her eyes puffy, Marcus, worried, asked her what was wrong, unable to contain her emotions, any longer, Dawn confessed her feelings for him, she screamed that she had always loved him, 
declaring herself as the only woman who deserved him, tears streamed down her cheeks as she whispered her deep love for him. Stunned, Marcus had no immediate response, realizing he had been oblivious to Dawn's feelings, sympathetic to her pain. He apologized for not understanding her situation. Dawn vigorously shook her head, refusing his apologies. Instead, she had one request, to experience a romantic relationship with him. Before Marcus could comprehend, Dawn pushed him against the wall, showering him with forceful kisses, she urged him to see how well they could fit together romantically and implored him to end things with Celine and marry her, in a gentle but firm manner. Marcus pushed Dawn away, shaking his head, he couldn't comply with her wishes and explained that ending his relationship with Celine wasn't possible. Apologizing once again, he left the bathroom, leaving Dawn grappling with the pain in her chest. From that day forward, Dawn became obsessed with winning over Marcus's love, she started dressing up to resemble Celine and would show up unannounced at their house, each time, Celine welcomed her warmly, unaware of Dawn's intentions, Dawn went to great lengths to discover their date nights and would disrupt the couple's romantic hangouts, initially, Celine dismissed it as coincidence, but as it persisted, even she grew suspicious. A year into Marcus and Celine's marriage, they welcomed their first daughter, Alexa, who became the apple of their eyes and was adored by many, Dawn's unrequited love had taken a toll, leading her down a path of obsession and interference in Marcus and Celine's lives, observing the growing bond between Marcus, Celine, and their child, Alexa, Dawn felt disheartened, for a while, she ceased her pursuit of Marcus, bringing a temporary sense of relief to him, however, a few months later, while Marcus was working in his office, Dawn barged in wearing a provocative dress from Celine's collection, and her makeup exuded sultriness, Marcus, anticipating her intentions, raised his defenses and asked what she wanted, Dawn, with a ghost-like smile, leaned forward, placing her hands on the edge of his table, and exposed her cleavage, she requested just one kiss, insisting that he could grant her that much, Marcus, apprehensive, jumped away from her reach, expressing his weariness and frustration with her persistent advances, he reminded Dawn of his family, a beautiful wife and an adorable daughter who meant the world to him, he pleaded with her to let him be, in response to Marcus's stern words, tears welled up in Dawn's eyes, seeing her emotional state, Marcus began to mumble an apology, but Dawn raised her hand to silence him, with anger in her eyes, she declared that she had had enough, she announced her resignation from the company and vowed to leave his life for good, moving abroad and completely out of his reach four years later. Tragedy struck as Celine was involved in a ghastly motor accident. Losing her life on impact, learning about the incident, Dawn hurriedly returned to the country to attend the funeral and support Marcus through his grief, Alexa, now five years old, was deeply affected, missing her mom terribly, she struggled with eating and was often in tears, Marcus, overwhelmed and uncertain, felt helpless, taking it upon herself to assist, Dawn learned about Alexa's preferences in food and prepared them, she discovered specific storybooks that Alexa liked and read them in. The manner Celine used to, Dawn adopted Celine's tone and read the stories to Alexa, who gradually began eating better and crying less, Dawn repeated this comforting routine until Alexa found solace, providing support to Marcus and his daughter during a difficult time. Marcus had witnessed Dawn's efforts and felt grateful for her support. Beyond preparing food, Dawn shared meals with him, engaged in conversations, assisted with errands, and surprised them with random gifts that evoked memories. Of their high school and college days, resurrecting these memories brought cheerfulness, and Marcus appreciated Dawn deeply. Slowly, Dawn had found her way into Marcus's heart, time passed quickly, and soon it was Alexa's sixth birthday, they celebrated in the park and Alexa, filled with joy, ran around and played, for many months after his wife's death, Marcus worked from home to keep an eye on Alexa, however, with her turning six, Marcus knew it was time for her to resume school, and he planned, to return to the office, concerned about how Alexa would cope after being away from school for so long, Marcus secretly prepared a beautiful doll with cameras as its eyes, he didn't disclose this to anyone, not even Dawn, when he presented the doll to Alexa as a birthday gift, she jumped with joy, promising to take good care of it. Dawn, too, had given Alexa a puzzle set for her birthday, while Alexa liked it. She favored her dad's gift, laughter filled the air when Marcus surprised everyone by 
getting down on one knee and offering a ring to Dawn. Grinning but nervous, Marcus thanked Dawn for selflessly being there when he and his daughter needed her the most, he expressed that they needed her to complete their family, overwhelmed with happiness, Dawn eagerly accepted the ring, and Alexa cheered with excitement. From that day forward, the trio became nearly inseparable, forming a close-knit family. As Christmas approached, they celebrated like a traditional family, going skiing, attending festive parties, meeting Santa Claus, and trying out different holiday food recipes, despite some recipe mishaps, they had fun decorating a tree with mismatched ornaments, wearing matching pajamas, and singing Christmas songs together, everything seemed fine until Marcus received a phone call from Dawn while he was at the office, her shaky voice hinted at tears, sending dread crawling up his spine, Marcus jumped from his seat, demanding to know where she was and what was happening, in that moment, Dawn delivered devastating news to Marcus. Alexa had been rushed to the hospital in an ambulance, asthmatic, something had triggered an attack, rendering her unconscious, Dawn couldn't assure Marcus of Alexa's well-being, overwhelmed with fear and disbelief, Marcus abandoned everything and rushed to the hospital, upon arrival, he received the heart-wrenching news, Alexa was pronounced dead, refusing to accept this reality, Marcus dashed to where her lifeless body lay covered, as he uncovered the cloth and saw his beautiful daughter, his knees gave way and he fell to the ground the world around him blurred but he managed to stand back up holding alexa's shoulders and pleading for her to open her eyes in his anguish he begged for this to be a cruel prank dawn seated in a corner went unnoticed as marcus was consumed by grief it had only been a year and a half since he lost his wife and now he couldn't fathom losing his little girl guilt weighed heavily on him questioning his ability to shake it off he blamed himself believing he should have been there to protect Alexa. On the day of Alexa's burial, Marcus placed the beautiful doll he had given her on her sixth birthday in her coffin, the funeral was solemn, with people paying their respects and sharing kind words about Alexa, many believed she was in a better place, urging Marcus to find comfort in that thought, Dawn stayed with Marcus long after others had left, providing support, however. As darkness fell and Marcus showed no sign of leaving, she quietly excused herself, giving him space to grieve, hours. Later, Marcus sat alone in his car, wanting to drive home but feeling an unbearable weight on his chest, his grief seemed unrelenting, and the heavy stone of sorrow wouldn't lift, in the depths of his grief, Marcus recalled the camera he had installed in the doll's eyes, hoping to find solace in the memories of when Alexa was alive, he turned on his phone and checked the camera recordings, randomly selecting a video, he witnessed a heart-wrenching scene in the living room, Alexa was struggling to breathe, the room smoky from burnt food, the recording revealed Dawn's shocking actions, instead of assisting Alexa in reaching her inhaler, Dawn snatched it and placed it on a higher shelf, Marcus watched in horror as Alexa gasped for breath until she fainted, Dawn, rather than helping immediately, calmly reached for her phone and called 911 with a panic that seemed completely fabricated, armed with the truth. Cold rage fueled Marcus, he took decisive action, calling the police and providing the video as evidence, Dawn was arrested, tried, and convicted to life imprisonment for her heinous crimes, Marcus, devoid of emotion, confronted her during the trial, labeling her a cold-blooded murderer, he declared that he would never have anything to do with her in his life again, Dawn's unhinged reaction led her to a mental institute, where she would spend the remainder of her days, seven years later. Marcus and his adopted daughter, the seven-year-old Alexa, visited her grave, they brought a bouquet, and Alexa tenderly placed it on the grave. Marcus affectionately patted her hair, and hand in hand, they turned around and went home, leaving behind the painful chapter of betrayal and tragedy. That's all for today's story, if you like it, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up, see you next time. When Janet Cavana's husband denied her and their three young children a home and sustenance. She had only one refuge, her mother's former rural residence. However, upon arrival, an unexpected discovery awaited her from the past. The vehicle swayed with every sharp turn on the unpaved road as the Cavana family journeyed to a small countryside town during the summer. While lacking urban amenities, the surroundings were breathtaking featuring numerous lakes and abundant vegetation. Janet, familiar with the area, was surprised to find that the roads had changed little over the years. In the back seat, 
Her three children slept. Indifferent to the scenery. Fatigued from the trip and recent hardships. Janet. Driving the rental car. Fought back tears. As months had passed since she could maintain composure without medication. She prayed that her children wouldn't sense her desperation. Upon reaching a driveway. Janet announced. Here we are. Rick. Nate. And Mila. Before them stood an old. Seemingly deserted house adorned by nature with wildflowers and overgrown weeds. Rick remarked. Mom. It looks like a house from a horror movie. And Mila added. Oh. That's scary. Although Janet knew the children wouldn't immediately appreciate the location. She hoped they would recognize its significance. Closing the car. Picking up her bags. And approaching the door. Janet reassured her children. It's only temporary. We'll figure it out. Despite their initial fear. The kids ran around. Exploring. Janet relied on their curiosity and the prospect of new adventures to occupy them after the harrowing experiences they had endured. Crossing the old fence, Janet spotted the nostalgic old mailbox on the property, triggering fond memories from her childhood. Meanwhile, Rick inspected the seemingly abandoned house, while Nate and the youngest, Mila, busied themselves with bugs and flowers. Nate exclaimed, There's a bee, and Mila chimed in. There's another one right here. 2. Their fascinated expressions reassured Janet about her plans. She reflected. If Matthew hadn't been so careless. We wouldn't be stranded in the middle of nowhere. Financially strained. But that's life. Despite the challenges. She maintained her resilience. Acknowledging the necessity of the breakup for the well-being of her children. Their 10-year marriage had been intense. Janet first encountered Matthew at the age of 23. He was a highly ethical and prosperous businessman. Committed to his work. Even he. NGS were spent together. With Matthew unwinding over a beer or whiskey after a stressful day at the office. Providing Janet with a sense of security. Their two-year courtship allowed her to establish herself professionally. And while not millionaires. They enjoyed an enviable income among friends and family. After stability seemed achieved, they decided to marry. Following the celebration, Matthew fulfilled a promise to his employees, distributing liters of whiskey as a token of success. This extravagance attracted influential individuals whose habits posed a threat to Matthew. Gambling began before the birth of their first child, Rick. Despite losses, Matthew downplayed them, attributing insignificance to the amounts. As a high roller by Mila's birth, he concerned Janet by risking substantial sums. Disagreements arose. With Matthew insisting on financial stability and responsible decision-making. Though apprehensive, Janet couldn't diminish his confidence. Home life appeared unaffected. As Matthew continued his early work routine, justifying his betting as a relaxing hobby that, when successful, would benefit the family. In hindsight, had Matthew foreseen the destructive impact of his habit, he might have heeded Janet's warnings. Janet's mother, Phyllis, aware of Matthew's bets, shared concerns about the potential unfavorable outcome. She couldn't fully articulate her concerns because, understandably, the money involved belonged to her son-in-law. However, Phyllis dreaded an impending disaster that would impact both her daughter and grandchildren. On one occasion, she questioned Janet. What will you do if he loses everything one day? Will you support him with our family money? Janet responded. He won't lose everything. The gambling money isn't what sustains this family. Mom. Phyllis expressed her hope that Janet was right. During a significant gambling spree, Matthew won a jackpot and used the prize money to take the entire family to Disney. Intending to showcase that his gambling was a harmless hobby under control. Those days were enchanting for Janet, Rick, Nate, and Mila. Janet believed that such surprises from her husband indicated the safety of their business and personal finances. However, Matthew's subsequent success fueled overconfidence, leading him to increase his bets. Contrary to his expectations, Matthew faced consecutive losses and had to borrow substantial sums from his business to cover the debts. He had to dismiss eight high-level employee. 
EES and implement an emergency restructuring without admitting the impact of his gambling addiction. Eventually, he sold his share of the business to his partner to settle household bills. No longer a business owner, he found himself in dire straits. This downfall severely affected his self-esteem and the family's livelihood. Janet grappled with the challenges of providing for her three kids' education and sustaining their daily lives. The situation worsened and a loan shark began demanding repayment for the loans Matthew had taken. Janet discovered the family's credit cards were blocked and she tried to purchase groceries for the month. Upon contacting the bank, she learned that her husband had depleted the couple's funds. Matthew had also acquired loans from the bank in recent months. And the deficit was so substantial that a bailiff would soon be at the family's doorstep unless the debt was settled. In essence, the family owed the bank an amount nearly equal to the value of their home, implying that the bank would sell the house to cover the debt. Upon hearing this, Janet felt stunned, as if the world had come to a halt around her. She couldn't comprehend how her husband could be so reckless and self-centered, accumulating debts in secret. Upon finding Matthew later, Janet's fatigue and boredom transformed into fury and a loss of control. She confronted him, expressing the severity of the situation. Do you realize how detrimental your actions are? Matthew, your hobby has cost our family a significant amount. We're on the verge of losing our home with three kids to care for. All because of a foolish game. Nervous and on medication to calm herself. She engaged in a heated argument with her husband. Despite Matthew insisting on bad luck, Janet was incredulous. What? Are you contemplating playing again? It is over. Understand that if you don't promise me right away, I'll take the kids and leave. Recognizing Janet's seriousness, Matthew bowed his head, remaining silent for a while before promising to change. He pleaded with his wife to stand by him and not leave. Janet considered selling their home before it went to auction aiming for a better value to fully settle the debt with the bank. However, it would only cover part of what Matthew owed the loan shark, who incessantly contacted family members. The looming question of where they would live weighed heavily on her mind as she surveyed the rooms and thought about the children. Taking a deep breath, Jan, E.T. disclosed the situation to her mother. Feeling mortified and wishing to disappear, she hadn't imagined their circumstances would deteriorate to such an extent. Janet requested access to family funds to settle the debt with the loan shark. The aged woman gazed sternly at her daughter and inquired. Are you certain about this decision? My daughter, if I provide you with that money, there will be nothing remaining for your future and that of my grandchildren. Except for our aged house in the rural area. With that mailbox you adored. Do you recall? Janet always desired to be the first to open it and eagerly bring the mail home during her childhood. Occasionally, her mother would sneak in some candies into the box for Janet to discover a delightful surprise. However, dwelling on the past wasn't suitable at this moment. Janet needed to contemplate her family's future. Consequently, she affirmed her intention to utilize the family funds to assist her husband. As he was an integral part of her family, Phyllis. Although distressed, pondered over her three grandchildren before ultimately agreeing to allocate all her lifelong savings. It was crucial to prevent Matthew from falling into trouble with the loan shark, ensuring that her grandchildren wouldn't end up homeless. The transfer became Phyllis's final act of kindness before her sudden illness and hospitalization. Leading to her demise 40 days later, Janet was deeply saddened by her mother's passing in the ICU sobbing for hours even after the funeral, with her children unable to console her. A week later, Janet received a letter from her mother through the family attorney, containing the remainder of Phyllis's belongings. Uncertain of its significance, Janet opened the envelope to find a handwritten note on plain paper. In the note, her mother wished her the best and mentioned the rural home where she had grown up as a refuge. The key to the place was enclosed. And Phyllis concluded the message with, May you only receive letters of happiness. This turn of events led Matthew to cease playing and face social isolation. Losing friends and encountering disdain from most of his family. The family had to vacate their beautiful house and settle for a rented, cramped apartment. Causing the three children to abandon private school due to the absence of their previous income. 
public schools couldn't accommodate them mid-year, leaving the kids bored and engaging in constant squabbles in the confined apartment. Hensefo. RTH. Janet began scrutinizing her husband with a more critical eye. He needed to improve for the sake of his family and restore his dignity. But the reality was that Matthew, weighed down by the consequences of his actions, succumbed to depression, leading him to rekindle an old companion, whiskey. Despite continuing to rise early each day in search of employment or odd jobs, Matthew found solace in alcohol. His former business partner, recognizing the potential for change, offered him a chance to rejoin the company not as a partner but as a senior employee, given his intimate knowledge of the business. Janet found hope in this opportunity, but upon returning home, Matthew's first inclination was to reach for a bottle. On idle days, he would succumb to intoxication and pass out on the couch, spiraling further. Though the prospect of a birthday party for his ex-partner's son presented a chance for redemption, Matthew's excessive drinking marred the event. In the midst of lively adult conversations and children playing in the garden, Matthew's behavior became embarrassing. He drank excessively, becoming unpleasant with other parents and even with his own wife. As he surpassed his limit, Janet attempted to persuade him to leave before ruining his last chance with his ex-partner. However, Matthew responded harshly, drawing attention by publicly rebuffing Janet, accusing her of ingratitude despite his past support. The awkward atmosphere among the guests and the evident disappointment of Matthew's ex-partner marked the pinnacle of embarrassment for Janet. She felt humiliated and struggled to comprehend how her life had reached this point. In the confines of their small apartment, devastation overwhelmed her as she reflected on her entire life. Feeling a mix of sadness and anger, Janet saw no alternative but to separate from her husband. Matthew was spiraling down a destructive path and she believed their three children shouldn't suffer the same fate. When the divorce papers arrived, Matthew seemingly welcomed them, signing them with a sense of victimhood, as if escaping from a troubled marriage. With no other recourse, Janet took the children and headed inland to her family's old house. Despite feeling broken and uncertain about the state of the house, she assured her children it was a temporary move, like a summer vacation though she had no clear plan for the future. Besides the house, Janet had nothing left. With her bank account nearly depleted, she knew she h. Add only a few months of financial cushion and would need to find a new job. Upon entering the old house, the children expressed apprehension, finding it dark and eerie. Janet, recalling how things worked there, went to open a wide window, filling the room with a golden glow that evoked nostalgia. The tranquility was disrupted by the sound of breaking glass. As Mila accidentally shattered a framed glass painting in the living room, while examining the damage, the youngest child noticed a small door in the wall, which Rick identified as a safe. Janet, intrigued, attempted various methods to open the safe but realized it required a specific key. As she pondered the whereabouts of the key, her gaze fell on the old mailbox at the front door triggering memories of her last conversation with her mother. The elderly woman had mentioned the mailbox in a peculiar way. Janet wondered if there was a connection between the mailbox and the mysterious safe. Motivated by a nostalgic impulse, Janet went to the front of the old house and checked the mailbox, a place where her mother had hidden sweets on numerous occasions. To her surprise, she discovered an additional hidden gem, a key that seemed as ancient as the house itself heavier than it appeared. Excitedly, she rushed back into the room and inserted the key into the lock. The vault door clicked sharply as she turned it, revealing a treasure trove that left Janet utterly speechless. Anticipating old family photos and letters, Janet found something unexpected, silver earrings, a substantial gold pendant, and various gold rings and necklaces neatly arranged in a case. Upon opening the pendant, she uncovered a picture of herself as a baby on one side and the heartfelt inscription, for Janet. Forever my most precious treasure, on the other. Reading it, Janet felt as if her mother was present with her in the old house. Overwhelmed with emotion, she clutched the diamond-studded pendant close to her heart, shedding tears for the powerful connection it symbolized and its significance in her life at that moment. Deeply moved, 
Janet began to sob, prompting Mila to inquire about her well-being. Opening her arms, Janet invited her children to join in a comforting embrace. Through tearful eyes, she reassured Mila that everything was better than ever, realizing the profound love her grandmother had for them. The following day, Janet took all of Miss Phyllis's old and valuable jewels out of the safe, deciding to estimate their worth. T. He valuation exceeded $400,000, providing Janet with financial security and eliminating the need for her ex-husband. As she looked out the window, witnessing Rick, Nate, and Mila playing among the wildflowers. With the sun setting, Janet acknowledged that Epta one now had a reason to smile. That's all about the first story and now let's watch another similar story. When Samantha Jackson received assistance to avoid embarrassment in the supermarket line, she had no inkling that her helper's intervention was serendipitous. Triggered by a specific item of clothing she had on, standing hesitantly in the bargain aisle on a chilly New York evening, Samantha grappled with indecision about what to purchase, contemplating whether to choose a can of tuna for her cherished cat, Lola. Samantha reminisced about rescuing Lola from a group of aggressive dogs, making the feline an indispensable part of her family. Despite facing financial challenges, Samantha consistently prioritized the well-being of her beloved cat. Her visit to the supermarket was solely dedicated to procuring something for Lola's dinner. Disregarding her own needs, the supermarket buzzed with activity, its fluorescent lights casting a clinical glow over meticulously arranged shelves. Samantha, lost in thought, stood in the checkout line, considering her options. The frigid New York evening and biting wind had driven her indoors to replenish essentials. As she perused the items on the shelves, Samantha felt a twinge of guilt due to her limited budget. Nevertheless, tonight was an exception. As she was thinking of someone special, her beloved cat, Lola, who she had rescued from the perilous streets of New York. Samantha reached for a can of tuna, a special treat for Lola that always brought a delighted response from the feline. However, as she approached the checkout counter, uncertainty crept in. Her wallet was nearly empty, containing only a few coins. Samantha had meticulously counted every cent to ensure she could afford the modest luxury for Lola. Placing the can of tuna on the conveyor belt, Samantha's heart raced, silently praying that her meager coins would be sufficient. The queue behind her grew, and impatience simmered among the waiting customers. Just as Samantha was on the verge of completing her coin count, an impatient shopper behind her accidentally bumped her elbow, causing the coins to slip from her grasp. They spilled onto the supermarket floor, resembling a shimmering, silver waterfall. Samantha, feeling embarrassed, hurriedly bent down to gather the scattered change, her hands trembling. The stern cashier, Brittany Parker, scolded her for the delay expressing impatience and suggesting that Samantha shouldn't come to the supermarket without sufficient money. Mumbling an apology, Samantha continued to pick up the coins while the irritable customers in line exchanged annoyed glances, making the situation increasingly uncomfortable. Amid the commotion, a notable figure emerged, a tall, middle-aged man named David Smith, the supermarket manager, with kind eyes and a calm demeanor. He approached Samantha and knelt beside her without passing judgment. Brittany Parker's authoritative scolding contrasted sharply with David Smith's considerate actions. Taken aback by this unexpected kindness, Samantha looked up at David with gratitude, silently questioning why a stranger would go out of his way to help in such an embarrassing moment. Unbeknownst to her, this chance encounter would mark the beginning of an unforeseen journey for both of them. As Samantha finished gathering the last of the scattered coins, David Smith, the manager, handed her a few stray pennies he had collected. His gentle voice reassured her, saying, Here you go, young lady, don't worry about it. These things happen. Though still flushed with embarrassment, Samantha managed a timid smile, expressing her gratitude. David nodded understandingly, remarking, No need to thank me. We all have our moments. Just take care of yourself. Before returning to the front of the store. While Samantha approached the cashier to count her meager coins for the can of tuna. 
Brittany Parker couldn't resist making another snide comment. Saying. Well. It's about time. Disregarding the cashier's sarcastic remarks. Samantha completed her transaction and hastily grabbed the can of tuna. Exiting the supermarket with her heart still racing from the embarrassing incident. The frigid wind stung her cheeks as she walked briskly toward her modest apartment. Eager to return to Lola. Who would be awaiting her? The peculiar encounter with David Smith lingered in her thoughts. His kindness contrasting sharply with the cashier's harsh words. In the following weeks. Samantha's visits to the supermarket became more frequent. Each time she went. She found herself glancing toward the checkout area. Hoping to catch another glimpse of David. His calming presence and their brief interactions brought her. A sense of ease. One evening. As she stood in line with a small basket of groceries. David approached her once again. This time holding a large. Reusable shopping bag filled with various items. Hello again. He greeted her with a warm smile. Samantha reciprocated the smile. Feeling comforted by his presence. David observed her basket and then the bag in his hand. Noting. You know. I've noticed you're a regular customer here. And you always seem to have a tight budget. How about I raise you a hand with your groceries today? Touched by his offer. Samantha hesitated. Not wanting to impose. David gently interrupted. Saying. Nonsense. Consider it a small token of appreciation for being a loyal customer. Plus. It's the least I can do after the incident with the coins. Overwhelmed by his generosity. Samantha expressed her gratitude. And David began transferring the items from her basket into the large shopping bag. As she watched. She felt a profound sense of gratitude and curiosity about what had prompted this stranger to extend such a kind offer. Unbeknownst to her. This encounter marked the beginning of a deep connection that would profoundly impact both of their lives. As weeks turned into months, Samantha's relationship with David deepened. She not only appreciated his assistance at the supermarket but also enjoyed their conversations and the genuine kindness he showed her. What began as a chance encounter in the checkout line had evolved into a meaningful friendship. One chilly evening, after David had helped Samantha pack her groceries, he invited her for a cup of coffee at a nearby cafe. Samantha agreed. Her interest in this man growing. She was eager to learn more about the person who had become a comforting presence in her life. Settling into a cozy corner of the cafe. Steam rising from their cups of hot coffee. Samantha gathered the courage to ask. Mr. Smith. You've been so kind to me. And I can't thank you enough. But why do you do it? You barely know me. David responded with a warm smile. His eyes reflecting a mix of emotions. Samantha. You remind me of someone I once knew. Someone I cared about deeply. I see a kindred spirit in you. And it feels right to offer help when I can. Touched by his words. Samantha nodded and couldn't help but inquire gently. Can you tell me more about this person you knew? David hesitated. As if considering how much to reveal. Her name was Amanda Jackson. She was a remarkable woman. Strong and compassionate. We shared. Some unforgettable moments together. Samantha's eyes widened at the mention of her mother's name. Amanda Jackson. That was my mother's name. David's expression shifted to astonishment. Your mother. That's quite a coincidence. Samantha. Did your mother ever mention someone named David Smith? Samantha. Puzzled revealed that her mother rarely discussed her personal life or relationships. Intrigued. She asked. Why do you ask? Taking a deep breath. David's gaze locked onto Samantha's. Samantha. I have a strong feeling that your mother and I may have known each other a long time ago. In fact. I believe there might be a connection between us. Samantha's heart quickened. Struggling to believe what she was hearing. What kind of connection? Are you saying you knew my mother intimately? David looked down at his coffee cup. His tone becoming somber. It's possible. Samantha. But I need to be sure. There's something I want to do to confirm it. Intrigued and overwhelmed with curiosity. Samantha leaned in. Urging him to share. What is it? Mr. Smith. Please. Tell me. Meeting her gaze once more. David revealed. I'd like to take a DNA test. Samantha. 
If the results confirm what I suspect. It could change both of our lives forever. Samantha's mind raced with a whirlwind of emotions. She had limited acquaintance with this man. Yet the allure of discovering the truth about her past proved too tempting to resist. She nodded slowly. Her voice expressing uncertainty. Very well. Mr. Smith. I'll undergo the test. But what are you hoping to uncover? David sighed. His eyes revealing a blend of hope and apprehension. Samantha. I believe there's a possibility that I might be your father. The disclosure lingered in the air. Creating an unspoken connection between them. Samantha and David were about to embark on a journey to unravel the mysteries of their pasts and unveil the truth behind Amanda Jackson's untold story. With the decision to undergo a DNA test hanging in the air, Samantha and David realized that their lives were on the verge of a profound transformation. The revelation that David could be Samantha's father was a truth neither could ignore. Sending shockwaves through their hearts. Days passed with anticipation and anxiety. Samantha and David chose to visit a reputable DNA testing facility together. In the sterile, well-lit lab, they underwent the simple procedure, providing cheek swabs that held the key to unlocking their familial connection. Leaving the FAC, illity, tension lingered between them. Samantha experienced a mix of emotions, excitement, fear, and uncertainty. David, on the other hand, displayed a determined look hinting at a long-buried longing. Weeks felt like an eternity as they awaited the results. Samantha continued her job at the supermarket, her mind often wandering, contemplating the father she might never have known. David, too, grappled with his emotions, reflecting on past choices and contemplating the future. Then, on a brisk autumn day, the long-awaited envelope arrived at Samantha's doorstep carefully tearing it open, her hands trembling with nervous energy. The words on the paper briefly blurred as tears welled up in her eyes. Soon, they came into focus, undeniable and life-altering. The DNA test confirmed what David had suspected, he was Samantha's biological father. The evidence was overwhelming. With a 99.9% match, Samantha was overwhelmed with a rush of emotions, joy, disbelief and a profound sense of belonging she had never felt before. She immediately called David, her voice shaking with excitement and tears. Mr. Smith. It's true. The test is positive. You're my father. David's heart swelled with a mixture of emotions. Two. Relief washed over him. Knowing that he had finally found the daughter he had unknowingly longed for. Samantha. I can't put into words how happy I am. I've waited a long time for this moment. Their bond, initially formed through chance and kindness, had now been solidified by blood and shared DNA. Samantha and David decided to meet to celebrate their newfound connection. During a delightful dinner at a charming restaurant, they engaged in heartfelt conversation late into the night, exchanging stories of their lives and making up for the years they had spent apart. As time unfolded, Samantha opened up her world to David sharing details about the lively neighborhood she called home, her cherished cat Lola, and the steadfast friends who had supported her through thick and thin. In return, David recounted tales of Amanda, the woman they had both loved, and the shared memories they had created. However, their journey had just commenced, leaving unanswered questions about Amanda's choices and the reasons behind concealing Samantha's parentage. Together, they pledged to unveil the truth paying homage to Amanda's memory and forging a new chapter in their lives as father and daughter. With each passing day, the bond between Samantha and David deepened, strengthened, by shared experiences and a newfound sense of family. Although the path ahead remained uncertain, they faced it together, determined to embrace the gift of their connection and the love that had brought them together. One clear night, as they gazed at the stars, Samantha whispered to her father, it's incredible how our paths cross, isn't it? David smiled, his heart brimming with gratitude. Yes, Samantha. It's a reminder that sometimes fate has a way of bringing people together when they need it most. In that moment, beneath the vast expanse of the night sky, 
Samantha and David found solace and hope in the beautiful story of their reunion, a tale of family, love, and the unbreakable ties that bound them together.